Welcome to the Your Houston Podcast. This is your host, Nicholas Hall. Welcome back, Nick. How you doing, Mario? I'm, I'm better now that you're uh, back in the co-host chair. It's always good to have a little bit of time where you can spend it towards a phenomenal organization that I feel is a great benefit to the community. And speaking of benefit to the community... Today, we are talking to Karen Patman, the chair of the board for Houston Metro. And we were talking all things Metro and transportation. Yeah, there's a lot of great stuff in this episode. I'm really looking forward to the audience learning about all of the different infrastructure projects, things that are getting people back to normal, moving them to their job as they kind of work their way back into the office. And doing it safely. Uh, during uh, uh, the pandemic. So lots to talk about and, and we're excited to have Karin and we will just go ahead and dive right in. Let's go. Well, we're ready. We're, we're going to start here. Now is the time for liftoff. I feel the liftoff. The clock has started. All right here. All right, here we go. We're going to get those brain juices flowing, get the cognitive matter in shape, if you will. We're going to start off with some rapid fire questions. First question, what's your favorite restaurant in Houston, and what are you going to order? And it's oh on us, God. by the way. We're paying for it. Oh, you are? Oh, my gosh. Well, it's hard to choose. It's really hard to choose. I would say El Tiempo, Relish, Carabas, Giacomo's. That's another really good Ooh. one. I'm sure I'm leaving some things off, but the chocolate pie at Giacomo's is out of this world. I'm going to second that answer. It really is. And now I have to try that because I haven't. It's, it's it. just divine. And okay. you know, you, you made Mario's day because he's been in this vibe where he thinks everyone's got to give a Tex-Mex answer to this thing. And so. Well, I did. El you, Tiempo. El Tiempo. Gave, yeah, but you added on to <laughs> that. You know, you, you expound it. So I like but that. But there are others as well. But those are really good ones. Okay. In your opinion, what city other than Houston has the best public transit? Well, you know, there's been a whole book written on that by Christoph Spieler, our former board member, who actually went to and studied and evaluated every transit system in the country. And it's a wonderful compendium. Um, Christoph, of course, is a, is a brilliant person who's a guru on all of these issues. So I would refer you to Christoph's book. And let me search and give you the title because I don't think you can you can – there are certain that are good in some ways, certain mm -hmm. that are good in other ways. So I think it'd be really hard to call a best transit system in the country. But if you wanted to make that determination, you need to read Christoph's book. All right. Good to know. Christoph's a brilliant mind. I'll tell you that much. He is. So we, we like to know if our Metro chair is currently up on transportation trends. Have you ever been on an electric scooter? <laughs> no, because if I were on an electric scooter, I would completely wipe myself out and I'd be stranded on the pavement and uh, I would be jeopardizing everybody else on the same sidewalk. And I do not like the idea of electric scooters all over the place. I think they're dangerous. I think they're, um, you know, walk for heaven's sakes, you know, how about some, how about some elbow grease walk? So anyway, no, I, I have not been, and I wouldn't risk my health or others getting on one. I had a close call in Austin with an electric scooter that just jolted out onto Congress and was going down the road. And I almost hit someone on an electric scooter. It, it was scary and it, I didn't like it either. Um, speaking of, well, I had the same experience in Austin and when you're driving along, you know, all of a sudden, cause they get in the streets too. Yeah. And I think they're horribly dangerous, but anyway, definitely not made for streets. Um, no. Okay. Okay. Trains, buses, people, an opinionated Atlas of us transit by Christoph Spieler. That's it. So okay. everybody, everybody needs to read it. I have. Speaking of books, what was the last book you read? Was it Christoph's book? No, uh, the last book I read was Hunter Biden's book. Oh, wow. And it was very, it, it was a wonderful book. He's a very brave man. And, you know, we all know people that have just struggled horribly with addiction, and he has. And 
right now he is uh, not using anything, but it's a very gripping story and he's, he's a good man. So I've also read Jill Biden's book recently, and that's really good. And then I read Susan Rice's book, and that's great. And I finished Barack Obama's autobiography. So all of those were were excellent. But one that I really uh, recommend to people in particular is Susan Rice's book, because I really didn't know uh, much about her other than just seeing her speak on the news and she has a riveting life story. And so I recommend it. Yeah. It doesn't sound like the art of the deal is anywhere on that list. So, no. so moving no. forward, the last question in the, in the, in the move of lightning that. spirits, um, you went to undergrad at Duke, you went to law school at UT, both solid schools. They're facing off in the next sweet 16. Who are you rooting for? Oh gosh. Don't put me in that position. I get put in um, there all the time. I went to UT for I'm, undergrad and I went to USC for law school. And people always say, who are you rooting for? And I go, it's, it's easy for me, but for you, who are you rooting for? It, I can't, I can't root. I mean, I, I, at Duke, you know, Cameron indoor stadium was an institution and it still exists. I mean, it's a relatively small stadium and I've been to so many basketball games and concerts, you know, Bruce drinks, Springsteen and others in Cameron Indoor Stadium that um, it, it really is. And then, but now, of course, I was just back at Duke recently and they built this whole complex around it. They preserved the original stadium, but they have this whole complex around it and lots of tributes to Coach K. And, uh, but no, I can't root. I mean, I grew up on on grew up in college on Duke basketball. And of course I love UT. So it's, 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 it's too close a call. I can see you with the face paint on, you know, I can see you there cheering them. You on. can see me with my little, if I'd known, I would have brought down my little beanie with blue devil horns on it and a D it's a great look. Well, that's going to wrap up our lightning round, and we're going to move on to our interview. We have a lot of uh, topics we want to cover with you, and we really appreciate you taking time out of your day and your busy schedule to chat with us. We're here with Karen Patman, chair of the board for Houston Metro, and we're here to talk all things local transportation and Metro. Uh, We're going to start with Metro next. Can you give us an update um, on how the implementation is going and if that has been impacted in any way with COVID? Well, we I can give you an update. Um, as you just to refresh people that aren't familiar with Metro Next, Metro Next is our $7.5 billion transit plan for Houston and the surrounding area. And it has 500 miles of travel improvements in all different modes little more rail, a lot of bus rapid transit, which is much, much less expensive than rail, but is known as rail on rubber, more suburban access, um, and just virtually everything, improved local bus service, uh, not only through the BRT, the bus rapid transit, which we're calling Metro Rapid, but through just taking our normal bus routes and improving those, making some into what's known as boost corridors, B-O-O-S-T. It's an acronym and I can never get it all, but bus operations, optimized system treatments is close. And so here's what we're starting on. First of all, even before the pandemic hit, we already had some federal money uh, for part of our rapid bus corridor from the Northwest Transit Center into downtown. And that will ultimately connect to the high speed rail and then from Dallas. And then, so, so we've got money for that. We're in a position to match it and we're moving forward on that. Uh, a personal priority of mine is the university corridor. Those with long memories would know that there was supposed to be a rail line on Richmond that came from downtown out to Hillcroft long, long time ago. And we have changed that into an, a rapid transit bus system because that way with the, with the savings, we can go all the way from Tidwell up in the Northeast 
all the way out to West Chase. So that's a huge advantage to bus rapid transit. And it, it's like rail. It has dedicated lanes. You just don't have to deal with those ugly catenary wires. It has platforms like rail. Um, it, 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 the, the, the feel is more like rail. If you've been on the uptown rapid system, that's an example of bus rapid transit. And it's more flexible than rail because you can use the buses in normal quarters. So anyway, my personal priority is that one. Then, of course, um, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee wants us to particularly uh, wants us to to get on the stick of getting that rail line to Hobby. It's already most of the way there, the purple and green lines, and they're going to join and go to Hobby. So all this to say, oh, and what we're doing um, right now is, what we're doing right now is we are implementing two of the boost corridors in the plan, getting started on those, and we are continuing what is also a part of Metro Next, but was part of our board priority before, and that is systematically upgrading our bus stops to make them fully accessible going beyond the requirements of the Americans with Disabilities Act. One of our board members authored the ADA, Dr. Lex Frieden, and he and Sanjay Ram, one of our excellent board members, have teamed in a task force I set up to get this done, and they continue to make progress on that. Now, and of course, um, the, 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 the American Jobs Act, President Biden's jobs bill, will hopefully help us fund some of these projects because in the bond we got authority for bonds for three and a half billion dollar match toward federal money and we don't issue those until we have a match pending uh and so we we need to get in the pipeline to get those federal grants for as many of these projects as we can and hopefully they'll get in the jobs act well that's you've so given, you've that's given us a lot of, a of great long- information because you literally answered two of our questions (laughs) with your response. Yep. Uh, So I'm going to move on to some COVID related topics. And we kind of touched on that with the federal funding. Um, How did COVID, like how did COVID impact the Metro operations overall? Well, it definitely impacted it significantly. Our ridership initially dropped by 60% um, once everybody was being encouraged to stay home. We were encouraging everybody to take only essential trips. And so it dropped from about 250,000 a day to about 100,000 a day. My understanding is that we're bumping back up towards 50% now. And what we're trying to do is work with the downtown businesses to figure out with respect to people that commute or take it to their downtown work, when are they going to be bringing their workforce back? There's a little bit of a chicken and egg situation here. They want to know when our service is going to resume. We want to know when we have people to transport to the jobs because they're going to buildings again. So we're working on that uh, balance. Jerome Gray is spearheading that study. And, but, but what, what it told me was, and, and by the way, we implemented every conceivable protocol you could, even before they were required. Um, Chief Lambert had was securing mask supplies so that we could encourage everyone to wear masks and give them one on the system. We imposed social distancing where we delineated what seats you could sit in with everybody six feet apart. Over time, we implemented temperature checks we, for, for our employees. We put plexiglass around the drivers, um, but a good number of our employees did get sick, which presumably means they're now immune, I hope, but it was still traumatic, you know, and of course we treated them very fairly with sick leave and that sort of thing. And now our biggest focus is getting our employees vaccinated. So we have various suppliers that, and uh, pharmacies that are coming to metro facilities to vaccinate. We encourage them to get vaccinated wherever they can if they get another opportunity to be vaccinated. And so that's a real focus of us now, but we still have a lot of the safety protocols in place. And even when, you know, under um, President Trump's administration, you know, there was a lot of, it seems to have been a lot of, seems to have been a lot of 
influence of the CDC, trying to pressure them to loosen the protocols. And as that was occurring, you know, we were sticking with the original CDC protocols. So we've been on the, I think I would say we've been a national leader on everything we've done to try to minimize transmission on our system. I don't know how you can get it on our system, quite frankly, uh, because we have so many enforced protocols in place that I think it would be very difficult to get it on our system. One thing that that Metro did that I was impressed with was, um, you know, being upfront when somebody in your workforce system tested positive, you know, they would send out an email that was very transparent. And that transparency is something that we advocate for a lot at the local level. Um, and to me, that was something that you, you did, but you know, you, maybe you didn't have to go that far to let everyone know on your email list or whoever signs up. Um, but I think that that was an important step just to building that trust. Like here's everything we're doing. Yes. You know, we had an employee test positive, but we're going to put that information out there and be upfront with the public. Well, I, we were proud of that as well. Uh, cause we, we think one of our hallmarks is our transparency. I mean, our financial statements are online, our checkbook is online, and we pride ourselves on transparency. So it was really important in light of the epidemic to let people know what drivers had contracted it and what routes they drove and times they drove yep. so that people that were on the bus could take extra precautions. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm very proud of that. So thank you for recognizing that. One point about Metronext that I didn't make is, obviously, as we move forward, you know, uh, we're going to take into account the data from how this has affected how people work and live all together. I mean, there's some thought that remote work will become more common, that there will be less need for people to travel the routes into downtown. So we're, we're, we're studying that very, very closely, and we are very good stewards of the taxpayer dollars. We won awards for that. Um, and, we, and we have a triple, last I checked, we had a triple A bond rating from Standard & Poor's. Um, last I looked was several months ago, but we, we are very good stewards of taxpayer dollars. And so we're going to take into account all of that information in terms of how we move forward with Metronext. Well, Chair Patman, you said earlier that you've been communicating with local businesses. What are you hearing from the business community regarding ridership returning to normal, employees returning to the office? Or does this look like there's going to be a continuation of the work from home kind of scenario and or a hybrid of the two? Uh, and how will that impact Metro's programming? Well, it, it will impact it once we reach resolution on what those issues are. And I don't think there's been a resolution yet. We're in contact with Central Houston, you know, that represents a lot of the downtown businesses. The Greater Houston Partnership, again, Jerome Gray is spearheading an effort to get on top of all this. So I can't give you an answer to what it looks like now because I just don't think we know. I mean, there are people that say, oh, remote work's gonna become the thing of the, of, the, of the future, the current and the future. And there are other people that say, you just don't get the same synergies and value from a re remote work that you do from collaboration in an in-person setting. So if I were to purely guess, I think there would, and this is what it would be as a pure guess, I think there would be a hybrid skewed toward in-person work because I myself find I have really missed for, it's been a year since I've been down into the offices of the agency and I have really missed being able to sit down with people and talk. There's just a freedom and a, an energy that yields, I think, good decision making. And, 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 you know, we've been doing it all by Zoom and it's been fine, but my guess is businesses are going to want their employees back most of the days of the week, but we'll see. Rent is expensive. Um, so we just don't know is the answer. Jerome will know though. He'll know. He'll be the one. <laughs> we'll be, we'll be on the lookout for, for whatever he finds out. Um, Going back to the boost lines, so we record this podcast uh, at an office on Studiwood Street, mm -hmm. and there was just a bunch of construction on this street, redoing the sidewalk ramps, uh, putting in these large pads at the, at the bus stops, and then we got a letter 
letting us know that that was part of a boost project. Uh, right. I'm so glad to hear that. I will say that the construction uh, happened rapidly. I mean, it, it usually when you think of a street construction, you think of it being there for months. They're already done and, and gone. And and I was impressed. I'm so glad to hear that. How quick yeah. it, it ha- So this is going to be a boost line. Uh, buses are going to be running here frequently, connecting folks uh, to different hubs. And this is what we can expect from other boost lines throughout the city. Yes, definitely. Um, so you must you're, be on either the 54 Scott or the 56 Airline Montrose, which are pretty long routes. And because those are the uh, two that we're working on right now. But yes, that is exactly right. And it's interesting, you know, the boost the boost corridors, there's certain things you can do that are just basic that improve service. And one, for example, is moving, uh, is signal priority, of course, slight signal priority, but also it's been studied that and shown that if you have the bus stop on the far side of the intersection, that saves time too and makes it more efficient. So some of it's, you know, moving the bus stops in uh, in certain ways better sidewalks, better crosswalks at intersections, improved accessibility. And that's what you've seen the construction of. So I'm, I'm real, I'm real glad to hear that. That's wonderful. Thank you. You know, we've used the bus uh, on the street before, and if it's raining, you know, you would get out in the mud. Uh, now there's a big concrete pad. I mean, there's just those small improvements do make riding Metro more appealing and, and more accessible. Um, one of the questions that we wanted to ask was when you, we, you look at bus stops, what goes into prioritizing, you know, what amenities go there in terms of yes. a shelter, a bench, um, any, yeah. anything along those lines? That's a really good question. And we um, wish so much we could have a shelter and amenities at every single one of our 9,000 bus stops. But it is cost prohibitive to do that. So, because, you know, shelters from the Houston weather would be just fantastic. Uh, But we look at ridership. We also look a little bit at the composition of the ridership. Um, If it's discretionary ridership or if it's people that really need to ride the bus, into work, et cetera. And we look at, it's a holistic approach. And I really probably should arrange for somebody that knows exactly every single metric and how we apply them to visit with you about that. But there is a set of metrics based in part on ridership, but not solely on ridership. Because sometimes the people, like say, let's say somebody um, a long way out, that doesn't have frequent service every 15 minutes or less might need a shelter more than someone who has a bus coming by every few minutes because so so you know the ridership is not the only metric but it is an important one so and we also believe in equity so we want to make sure that when we build these shelters and uh, put in these good bus pads etc start replacing the bus pads that we're being equitable toward the community we serve so while we're sitting here i just did some quick in my mind back of the envelope math so nine thousand stops just mm-hmm. say fifty percent of them are covered. Do we know how many of them are covered? No, no, um, two thousand are covered. Now that may have changed. Yeah, so that may about, have changed. At, at about ten thousand per stop, that's seventy million dollars. We'll just add some on. We'll say we'll go up to a hundred million dollars for capital improvement project to make sure every site's covered. So that sounds like we need additional funding. And if it doesn't all come from the stimulus package. Could Metro allow for advertising on the buses and well, the, the cars? Funny. And, Yes, funny you should say that because we are very quickly going to be considering advertising. Um, A lot of transit agencies do it. And I think at this point in time, something I personally feel is that we should strongly consider it. That's a board decision, but I completely think that any sources of revenue we can get are really important. 
And um, we're, we're even our disability and accessibility initiative of improving these bus stops, which don't in, always involve putting a shelter on, sometimes do. Even that, you know, we're doing over time. We've budgeted over time. And so you're absolutely right that a big infusion of funds would be wonderful. Now, one thing I've thought of, and because all of us on the call are involved with various parts of the nonprofit world, you know, it would really be great to have a um, create a bus shelter program where people came in and gave $25,000, $30,000, and they had a little bus shelter name for them. You know, the, you have to have the buy-in of the city, and they're very bought in to the accessibility initiative, by the way, because all this has to be coordinated with the city in places that were within the city. So it's more complicated than it looks, but it's something I've thought about on my long list of yet to be accomplished. Well, just and hearing, maybe when I'm out the board, I'll spearhead that. Just hearing, and I'm uh, sure that I'm sure that your boulevard, that Bill and Mario, will want to fund a bus shelter. It's just right up their alley. Your Houston like, would absolutely. Hey, it sounds like good advertising, right? It's a win-win-win. So it's wonderful. Well, you think and about eventually the, we're going to have like on the bus shelters. Eventually, we'll have that. Um, real-time computerized advertising. I'm showing my age. What, what do you call that? <laughs> digital, digital, digital ads. Digital, and then maybe digital, yeah, digital. we'll take it a step further. Maybe one day we'll even have them air conditioned. You know? Well, Congresswoman Lizzie Fletcher, as soon as she was elected, called me and said, now listen, I think you ought to have solar powered uh, uh, air conditioning in the bus shelters or fans. And can we work on that? Use solar power. And, you know, it was a great, great idea. And we, we still are in some communication about that. It is true that a number of other things have sort of taken priority to that at this point, like getting a big tranche of infrastructure money, which she's been working hard on. Yep. Well, it's, it's encouraging to hear that Metro is going to consider advertising on the buses and, and the shelter. Because I think that that can be a great source of, of additional funds for these amenities that just help spread the equity around, spread the uh, comfort of the stops and the accessibility uh, all across the city. 9,000 bus stops is a ton of bus stops. Does any other city have 9,000 bus stops? You know, I do not know. I mean, you know who would know? Christoph. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know. I have to assume they do. You know, the idea of bus stops is that they're two blocks apart. And um, so I'm confident other cities have as many and maybe more. I can't imagine that New York City, which also has a robust bus system as well as the subway, doesn't have more in some of the other cities. But I don't know. Yeah. I mean, we, we're the fourth largest city in the country. So, But on a land basis, we're the second largest, second to Jacksonville, I believe. Florida. Oh, really? Yeah, I think so. But they have a lot of, you know, coverage by water. So we have the most mm. land well, of those yeah. of those largest cities by population. So you'd think we'd have a lot of stops. One well, you would, and you know, um, one of the one of the great things is not only are we partnering with the city, but county commissioners can allocate portions of their budget to this sort of thing too. And so we work with them to try to get money to improve the stops in their area. One Along thing with bike that, trails. Uh, I, have to, I have to say that because of Commissioner Ellis. Got to oh. have bike trails. Those aren't exactly our wheelhouse, but he does devote a lot of his funding to that. But, but yeah, we, the commissioner um, and other commissioners have been very generous in helping us fund some of these improvements out of their budgets. One thing that I want to make sure to ask, because a lot of people mentioned this to us as we were talking about this episode, um, you talked about rail to hobby as metro, part of Metro Next. Is mm -hmm. there a timeline on when people can expect to take a rail to, to Hobby Airport? Well, it's not going to be tomorrow. Here's the way the federal grant process works. And on a major capital project like extension of a rail line or bus rapid transit, the way it generally works is 
you make an application to the federal government for a grant to match local funding. Now, one great thing that's happened in the Biden administration is in the Trump administration, the match was 50-50. They, they, and sometimes even 40 government, 60 local. Under the Biden administration, it looks as though it's going to be 80% government, 20% local, which will enable us to do a lot more. But at any rate, and that's what it used to be way back in the day. So we, you apply for a grant. You have to go through a pretty rigorous process. You have to go through engineering, environmental, um, in, which includes impact on the communities. And so you, you get a lot of community buy-in, although we put lines to start with on our Metro Next map, you know, everybody will have a chance to weigh in on, do I really want that line there? Uh, and, and, and then we give the federal government all of this information, and then they decide whether to award a grant or not. That's how the, the uh, purple line was built. And let's see, another line as well. Well, no, the, the green line was local funding. Oh, yeah, the extension of the red line going north. The original red line was not built with federal funding, but the extension going north was built with federal funding. And so you asked for the grants. It took years and years and years to get those grants authorized. So, you know, I know the mayor has a really great relationship with Secretary Buttigieg, and um, we're going to just push it as hard as we can. But we're just now starting that process now of getting in the grant line. So we have some time before that. We have a lot of time, okay. I'm sorry to say. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, that's for good any to know. Of these projects, good, for know. any of these projects that we can't do with local funds. If we can do the boost quarters, but we can't do a major capital project. So yeah, we have, we have time. You know, as an organization we've discussed, and I think we're actually working towards kind of coordinating, uh, the grant, I mean, Mario, how would you explain it? I mean, we have an intern coming in. We're going to kind of do some outreach and meet with all the players that be within the, the realm to truly figure out the most strategic way to go after the infrastructure dollars to the extent the $1.9 trillion or whatever it is at this point um, infrastructure plan is approved. We do. We just approved, the board just approved an internship uh, at the last meeting with your oh, Houston. Wonderful. Uh, and it's going to be with Mike Floyd coming uh as a Harry S. Truman scholar, and he'll spend the summer wow. studying the regional infrastructure needs and then putting together a, a region wide needs assessment. But then also, uh, because we don't know how much movement the infrastructure package will make between now and then, but uh, putting together a toolkit on how to draw down on federal dollars to meet oh. those needs. Well, Please, I hope y'all will come present that to the board when he's done that. Um, we do have, obviously, whole departments that are dedicated to that as well. Uh, but what we find when we get another mind engaged is we learn something new. So I'm really hoping that uh, y'all will share that with us. And in fact, when he's down here, if you want if he wants to meet with some of our team, you know, I can certainly facilitate that. I think that would be, that would be great. Cause we're going to try and get, you know, and him to meet with as many folks as, as we can that sure. are involved in this arena and uh, we'll present the report in early August. We'll have an event. We're happy to come talk to y'all oh, at a board wonderful. meeting. And we're refining the scope kind of of that, that assignment. And so one of the things is we know there's so many silos and there's so much overlap and competition between these organizations dealing with transportation. Is there anything, you know, that you would like to see outside of Metro? Is there anything that you would like, if you could commission a report from an organization outside of Metro, what task would you assign for this research? Wow. Um, I would really have to think about that. Um, I can't come up with an answer off the top of my head because my mind is so around Metro and you're asking outside of Metro. I will tell you a valuable project would be working with Jerome to figure out what the new landscape of work is going to be. 
I mean, that is, we are working on that, but I think we need all the input we can get on what the new normal is going to be moving forward so that we spend those tax dollars very wisely. Um, but, but, you know, thank you for the offer and we'll hopefully take you up on it. Yeah. And I, I hope this establishes welcome. an on, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, I this know. probably won't be on the podcast, this part. I mean, I'm just literally, we're sitting here talking, and I was just kind of like, well, we're talking about these things related to the yeah. infrastructure package. Yeah, well, we we're putting this together, you know, let's get some input. And, I mean, really, it's it's an opportunity for you to think outside of the, you know, the, the chairmanship or that that kind of role of, like, what could really help, uh, you know, with the, the coordination out in the other landscape between the other nonprofits and, you know, the government corps and everything else. Yes. I think it's a very good build your own bus shelter. That's number one. Somebody <laughs> take that on as a nonprofit cause, but I know what you're saying. And I think one thing that might be wonderful is for me to set you all up with Tom Lambert, our CEO and some of the other officers. And we sit around and, and brainstorm a little bit and I'll ask them these questions too, because I'll bet you anything Tom Lambert has a wish list of a number of things that could be very, very helpful. So let's, it could let's be the get unofficial, that unofficial, unofficial behind the scenes kind of, yeah. you know, yeah. research analyst. Sure. We'd love to, we'll spotlight you. No need to stay behind the scenes. I mean, thank you for that. Thank you for your time. We're going to move into our, my favorite segment. I think it's Mario's too. Um, because of the soundbite. Yes, it is. Okay, so here we go. You know what time it is. Houston, we've got a problem. Okay, Houston, we've had a problem here. This is Houston, say again, please. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. Oh, that's a good soundbite. Oh, it's it's quintessential Houston. <laughs> um, so in, in the vein of infrastructure, an infrastructure bill passes Congress and is signed by the president. It allocates $300 billion to Houston for transit and mobility and tasked you with overseeing its implementation. What projects would you make sure are done first? Well, and I think we did cover that earlier on. Um, I think that, that the rapid transit projects that are in the Metro next proposal, uh, which require several billion dollars to get implemented. Um, in fact, more than that, I think, I think all of those we should start seeking funding for and see now you have to do it sort of in sequence. So, uh, again, we already are working on the inner Katie bus rapid transit is what we call it. And I think that uh, I know there's there's a lot of support for going to hobby, so that would be something that I know will have congressional representatives advocating for. Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee um, taking you know establishing some form of rapid transit down into Fort Bend County, where we have a lot of commuters, is something that Congressman Al Green has spearheaded and is very important to him. And then my own personal favorite is the university corridor, as I mentioned earlier, from Tidwell all the way out to West Chase. I think it's going to be a dramatic game changer for our region. And when you connect it to the uptown bus rapid transit and then the inner Katy bus rapid transit, you're just going to have a loop mm -hmm. of rapid transit in Houston. So, and I know that our local officials, um, uh, Democratic and Republican, you know, Congresswoman Garcia, Congresswoman Fletcher, com Congress, um, and that's been a real gift to us, you know, Lizzie Fletcher. She's just outstanding. And so she, she's been able to move in. But all of our local elected officials do a really good job. And Congressman Babin, I mean, others. So we just really need to, um, I think Congressman Niels may get involved in some things for us. So we're very lucky. We've got some really good advocates up there for transit in Houston, and we'll just be working to get the money here. You know, we've been deprived for a really long time. Dallas has gotten a whole lot of grant money for rapid transit, and they used it to 
build out their rail system at a time when rail was sort of the only game in town. Now that we have bus rapid transit, we will use more of that kind of money to build out our BRT, but it, we're way overdue for a, a, a tranche of money to come into Houston. It creates jobs, it creates opportunity. It's a wonderful wealth creator and we're well overdue for that. So I think it's time for us to just aggressively pursue that. And you know, BRT is such a Houston solution. It's pragmatic and it's what we need. Yeah. And so it just, it needs to happen. And I'm glad that you're mm -hmm. in the leadership position to kind of push these issues and, and make sure that they're, they're getting the appropriate attention. So thank you for everything that you do for the city of Houston. I know that is serving on a city board. You don't hear it enough, but we really do appreciate everything you're doing. Oh, thank you so very much. Well, thank you all for all you do for the city of Houston. And I look forward in, in, for these future collaborations. Yes, that, they're, they're going to be great. And we're going to work really hard this summer to put a great report together. And we look forward to working with you and, and your team on that. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, I really think I've, I've, I've gotten a chair for the build your own bus shelter initiative. And I think it's, it's Billy Baldwin. That's where I think I'm going with this. <laughs> he will be your biggest you know, advocate for that. Let me tell you. <laughs> I know. I think it's, it's, it's Billy Bob Baldwin. I'm not sure his middle name is Bob, but it is his first name is Billy. And he's a very, very dear friend. And I think tell him since he didn't come today, he got elected to do this. Okay. That's what happens. All right. Yeah. I will it was unanimous. Him unanimous. <laughs> Build a shelter. I can see it right now. It can kind of be the, like the Habitat for Humanity version of, yeah. of like building these shelters. Yeah. You know? yeah, actually, I wonder if you could build physically build shelters. Uh, Normally, there are these. I think that would be a that would be a waste. I think really you should bring in the good old fiberglass yep. and. No, but if yeah. you could do it on site and pre-build before it's assembled on site, now that uh -huh. would work. It would just be an issue mm -hmm. coordinating with logistics within the communities and traffic and just be too much liability. That's my own opinion. So. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's more complex. You have, again, you have to have the city buy-in and the county if it's in the yeah. unincorporated area. So it's, it's more complex than it seems, but it sure would be great. It would it set sure us apart would. as a transit agency. But, but companies would do that from just a team building exercise for their employees. So Allison Hay is the executive director of Habitat for Humanity. She's awesome. Um, and so if you need any input on, on something like that, definitely. Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great thought. I've sort of gotten it out of the barn here today. It's been in my mind for a long time. Uh, but it, it is something that I think would be absolutely wonderful if we could get that going. And ha Habitat could be like the general contractor to kind of manage it since they already do this on a house basis. That'd be helping out another local nonprofit. But, you know, hey, we'll see where it goes. But we do we'll appreciate your time. Goes. Appreciate everything you're doing. Oh, yes, thank you do. all. Thank you all so very much. Thank you so much, Karin, for taking time out of your busy day to chat with us about local quality of life transportation issues. We really appreciate the conversation and the information. And if you're new to the show or you've been a longtime viewer, please make sure you're subscribed. Please like the show and please go down and give us those comments. And until next time. This has been another episode of Your Houston, the nonprofit where you make a difference.